right, so I'll start with your bio. Robert Saltzman is a photographer, retired depth psychotherapist, and the author of two books on finding one's own mind, The 10,000 Things and Depending on No Thing. He lives in Todos Santos, Mexico, with his wife, Catania, three donkeys, and a herd of cats. I get that right? Sounds good to me. <laughs> Excellent. So I'll just, um, I'll tell everyone, you know, uh, I'll, I'm going to open up this Q&A box so that I can see it um, and, uh, and just chime in with your questions. And what we'll do, Robert, is I'll just, um, I'll just read them out loud to you and we'll, we'll basically go from there. But I'm going to start, um, I'm going to start with a, a quote of something you've written that I'd love to get you uh, to talk about. All right. Um, okay. This collective suffering has brought upon a readiness and many human beings for the evolutionary leap that is spiritual awakening. For many individuals alive now, this means they have suffered enough. No further suffering is necessary. The end of suffering, that is also the essence of every spiritual teaching. Be grateful that your suffering has taken you to this realization. I don't need to suffer. Yes, well, those aren't my words. They're not? No, I may have quoted them. I don't oh, know. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> but, um, that's nothing I would ever say. Oh, <laughs> perfect. Not, not in the ballpark, not remotely. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Perfect. Well, let's, let's start off with some horrible job on my part. Um, well, I wouldn't say that. I mean, oh, okay. actually, negation is uh, more important than affirmation at a time when so many people are hypnotized. Okay. It's negation. In other words, you, you stated something that is a non-dual trope. Everyone wants to believe that there's this carrot at the end of the universe called, I won't suffer anymore. And the whole sales pitch is that someone has the key to open that box for you where there's no suffering. That's it. And my whole approach to this is to be honest and to say, I find myself awake, but not without suffering. In fact, quite the opposite. I think as we awaken, we suffer more, not less. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And so the awakeness, a part of the awakeness, part of the essence of what I call awake, and I understand other people have other definitions. We have to live with that. And that's fine. But for me, the essence of it is to be with what is. If that's a toothache, well, it just is. You have to suffer. If it's a broken heart, which is non-material, not like a toothache, okay, it is, you know. And I've had a broken heart. Most people have really in one way or another. And the idea that we can escape from that into nirvana here, where you never feel that anymore to me is, uh, well, it borders on delusional. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I think um, uh, clearly I've only seen one, uh, one stage this weekend, but, um, but I think that the, the speakers that, are resonating here are those that are talking about the, for lack of a better phrase, we'll call it the human condition that just happens and not this escape, but more of an invitation to. Oh, that's good to hear because I think that message is what um, spiritual people, people who would call themselves spiritual, I, I put on the scare quotes because I can't really separate spirit from matter myself. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a bit humorous or, or ironic that people who call themselves non-dualists would immediately bifurcate reality into matter and spirit. Uh, it's, that's uh, the ultimate duality, actually, making a duality from where there wasn't one in the first place. There's no spirit. There's no matter. This is it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's not two different it's. It's, it's all of a piece. It's, this is it. This is it. That's a, there's a long history of that. I don't know if we have time for that today, but I could go into vitalism and how um, even up to the 18th century, spirit was split, was split from matter. And that idea persists now because people are ignorant of science. Well, keep going with that. that. That sounds great. Okay, well, let me take a step back then. Um, vitalism is a very ancient idea. 
It goes back to the ancients, the Greeks and all of this. And it persisted within science also until the 18th century. What they believe then is that there are certain compounds that are organic and we find them in living things like, you know, a tree or charcoal is also, that carbon is organic. Those compounds had, were organic. What made them organic is that they had a vital force. They have a life force. And inorganic compounds did not have that life force. They were separated in that way. But what happened in the 19th century is that some cat, a free thinker, didn't take that as a final answer. And he synthesized urea, urea in the laboratory, which was a so-called organic compound. And he synthesized it from completely non-organic sources. So there was no way for this Elon Vital or this spirit to have, okay. Now, I'm not saying that science is the only way to find things out. I would never say that, but it's the best way. We know that because this entire world is running on an immense complexity of things that work. And they work because the theories behind them weren't just speculation, they actually got you somewhere. Okay, that's real. That is real. In other words, you and I are having a conversation now because of a hundred years of mathematics and, and physics has culminated in this ability. I can't imagine why someone would say that we're dreaming this. A dream is a dream and this is what we're actually doing, yes? And if there's some other place, I have no idea where that is. Okay, but to, I'm just on a, on a rant now, but let's return to the, return to the vitalism because that was the point. I don't want to, I don't want to drop it. So there was this idea that there are two worlds, matter and spirit. In Christian mythology, God made a man out of clay and he breathed the life into him. The word for the word spirit means breath. So this is that's this myth that inanimate objects become alive because they have spirit in them. And other things don't have spirit and they're dead. They're They've never been alive and they can't get alive. So our intelligence in that way of speaking is spiritual. That's the idea, it was, comes from the outside and it's put into this clay vessel here. It's what Alan Watts called the ceramic, um, the ceramic um, theory of the universe, ceramic view of the universe. So that is the belief that pervades non-duality. The idea is consciousness is primary. All this is just material. It's a dream. That's, that's the basic idea. Not every non-dualist believes that, but a big proportion of them do. I know that because I've discussed this with hundreds of people by now. So that's a prevailing view. On the scientific community, they have the mirror image of that. They would say that's utter nonsense. There's nothing to it at all, impossible. And they would cite the hard science and that'd be the end of the conversation. Okay. Well, a guy like me is a trouble to both, it's pox on both their houses, see? Truly, although I like the science more, a lot more. But if, if one of the scientists goes too far into scientism, I'll nail him on it. So I just say that now because what I'm saying now is about to nail a lot of people, a lot of people. And I'm sorry. I, I really am in a way. It, it, I don't like to hurt people, but I'm about, <laughs> hurt, but I'm about to hurt a few people. I'm sure of it. And I, I, I asked myself when you invited me to do this interview, I asked myself what I wanted to talk about, and this is it. So for better or worse. If you believe that consciousness is the only thing that really exists, 
You may be right. I don't know. And no one else does either. And that is the point. That is the point. There's a lot of evidence against it, and that evidence is growing. So if you want to hold on to that belief, I think you're going to be, see the water is rising. But I'm not sure of that. So that's not my point. I'm just opening that door because it has to be open. If you have that belief that Nisargadatta knew truth and you read it in a book and now you know it, which is cuckoo, but okay. I mean, as a writer myself, I can never express truth in words. Best I can do is point to it and that'll be misunderstood as soon as the fox is out of the box, right? There's no, there's no you can't. But if you are someone who believes that Nisargadatta, when he said it's all just consciousness and that's it, and you believe that, if you do not know about 20, 20th century and 21st century science, you have painted yourself into a corner, which may not be the right corner. That may not be the one where you want to hang out for the rest of your life. So at least I'm advising all the spiritual people, find out about physics and chemistry. It's come a long way, baby. A long, 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 long way. So to get back to the vitalism, because this is the point. The average, the average um, Facebook enlightened person believes in um, the life force. Of course they do. They believe in the life force. That's what energy healers use, and of course it works. Someone will get a, a Reiki master certificate, takes a weekend and a hundred bucks, and now you can send vibrations out through your palms and heal people because of the vital force. Be the vital force. Well, there is no fucking vital force. It's been disproved. We've moved on from there. It's, this, is not, this is not controversial. There may be other explanations for how a Reiki master heals, but it's, it ain't no vital force. That's not the explanation. And that is, here's my point. If you accept explanations because you don't know, but you don't want to maintain that space of not knowing because it, there's too much anxiety involved, and what if there is no meaning to life, and what if you just die and nothing groovy happens and all the rest of it. If that's too much anxiety, you'll just seize on an explanation and you fill that space with it. And that's what I see in the non-dual community with a few exceptions, a few exceptions. There's some people I've met in the non-dual community who are aware of science, are aware of philosophy, understand the issues involved, and they still feel for reasons of their own some of them are bhaktis and actually just feel this love connection that they can't deny. Or whatever it is, they feel it's just consciousness. And I'm not saying they're wrong, but those are the, the people I respect are the ones who know the issues and have a reason for believing that it's just consciousness, not Nisargadatta says so. And that is my message, so I've, I've, I've said it. Well, I, I, you didn't hurt my feelings, and uh, and I, I don't I don't think that you probably bummed anyone else out. But it, it sounds like what you're saying is just it just comes from experience. You have to look to that, um, and wh whatever comes up from that experience, you're saying if if you're just believing it in a book, then that's okay. And if you believe it's all consciousness, you're saying you don't know either. But in your experience, uh, it's different. Um, no, credulity and skepticism are not opposites. Skepticism is a valid approach to understanding the world. Um, but, but, but credulity is not a valid approach to understanding the world. 
the credulity that says, that's a Zen master, he must know what to do in this situation, I'll consult him. See, that's credulity. That is a, not, in my view, a valid approach to living. If I, I, I would rule it out, of course, but if someone came to me and said, what do you think about consulting the Zen master on whether I should marry this woman or not? I know what my advice would be. And, and yet, those are the people who are running the lives of all of these people who sit at their feet and believe that, I won't say any names, I've already done that and been famous for it. And I think, I, I think that happened because that bullshit needed to get cleared out. But let's say it's cleared out now, because I see other people have glommed on to this theme now. There's more of it around. Not that I caused it, but just it seems to be the pendulum, the non-dual pendulum swung way fucking far. And now I think it's coming back. I did this interview with Tim Freak, who's a, who's a cool guy. It was a beautiful interview. He had written 35 books. He's a famous philosopher. He's on lists. And um, he's... He wrote 35 books, and the bulk of them expressed the classic non-dual view. And in our interview, he said that he had moved away from that. That's why he was interviewing me, because I had expressed this doubt about some teacher of that non-duality stuff. And he felt that doubt, and the two of us got together to discuss it. And he's an influential person, and he's moving away from that now. I'm not really an influential person, but I'm, I've never been there. I saw non-duality as a cul-de-sac the moment I, I got a whiff of it. <laughs> there really is, now I want to be clear on this, no, because there really is non-duality. But there's also not non-duality. And there's also not either duality or non-duality. There's, there's non-duality, there's no non-duality, and there's neither no non-duality or non-duality. All of that is here in reality. Not that non-duality is reality and the rest of all these other items that we put in the box throw them away. That's not it. Understood. Well, I've, uh, I was on your website and reading some things and I live in Costa Rica and in Costa Rica, there are these guys that go up on the mountainside, they call them chapeadoras, just with a machete, packing away the, the side of the mountain. And everything I read of yours, I feel like is, it, it has that chapeadora energy just hacking away. Um, I mean, I know, I, I don't know, well, I have some other questions that I can ask, but I was gonna wait. But I know you have uh, obviously some strong thoughts about religion um, as well. Um, but I don't, in some cases, if people know about you, they probably already read those. But if you have some, some words you'd like to share on that, we could start with that. And then I'll get into some of the Q&A. Okay, that's a simple question, which I can answer in just a paragraph. Okay. There are people I've met who consider this themselves religious, who have, are open minded, understand science, understand the philosophical issues involved, and feel this attraction toward the idea of God. They understand the scriptures, not as fact, but as mythology that refers to something sacred that they believe humans have as a birthright. Those people are groovy. You can meet someone like that. I, if I meet someone like that, I'm happy. If that has a big cross around the neck, no problem. The rest of the people who are using this like drugs, I have no, I have compassion for them, but not much interest in discussing these matters at all. So I don't even talk about religion. I just say, I don't need God. God's just a word to me. And it could be like unicorn refers to nothing. Um, that's my attitude, but as I just want to emphasize, there are religious people to whom I would not say that about what they, do with their minds. There are people like that. A good example is Thomas Merton. I don't know if people know him. I, 
I used to read him. He was a Christian mystic and put things in those terms. And I kind of liked him. But then when I found out that he, someone had given, given him a camera and he became fascinated with it and spent days with this camera. I'm, I'm, I like cameras too. So then I, I, I became more interested in him and picked up on his writing. And I would say that if the two of us sat down and had a dialectic, that's a beautiful word, dialectic. It means a conversation where you're not trying to convince anybody of anything. You're just discussing the matter. You're circumambulating the, the matter with a partner. And you may not agree on everything, but it's not your agreement or disagreement that you're seeking, but to understand what the other person, how the other person sees it. Mm -hmm. So that interview was, with Tim Freak was a dialectic. We both approached in that spirit. And since I really understand how to do that, it's like a dance. It's like dancing. Once you, you know, you've got the move, it's, <laughs> you, don't want to, you don't want to do anything else. Right? Yeah, that's what I was saying. It's, it's like a, that, that is a lost, or it seems to be a lost dance these days where everyone's just trying to drive home their point and not listening to anything else. Well, the social media thing, as has been pointed out most recently in that film that's circulating, uh, forget the title, Dis Disconnected or whatever. Um, this is being imposed upon us by our technology because the idea is to get out there and be groovy and have a great appearance and be buffed up and all my ideas are perfect and I never got something wrong. And it, it's uh, madness. What, the way I see us in general, and I'm speaking personally about myself also, is wounded, vulnerable. There are a lot of fears of which we are not aware, but we know they're there. We can feel them driving us to overeat or have sex compulsively or drink too much or who knows, could be anything. We're driven by that. We try to resist all that behavior, but wow, this, we're being whipped by anxiety, see? This is what I did in psychotherapy, to make people understand that their anxieties need to be owned up to and embraced, and somehow even you're supposed to kind of have compassion for them. Yes? But nobody's doing it. I'm not, not nobody. There are people still doing that, but it's a, it's a, it's a fading art. Psychotherapy is a fading art. Now it's chemicals. Somebody comes in, you talk for 10 minutes and you give them a prescription. It's great, 50 bucks for that or 50 bucks to spend the whole hour with the person. I always went for the, the whole hour, but I had colleagues who liked the, you know, the five minute job even. And so this is what we're dealing with. This is another point which I don't stress anymore, but I did a couple of years ago you know, about the money. I mean, this is a conference and people are paying for it, but this one seems to have value. But a lot of these things are just total scams. The, the, the guru on the throne may be speaking truth in the, in the broad sense of this is in the literature, this is in the um, tradition. Now I'll teach it to you. But actually, it's, you could read the book at the library for free or online. Or you could talk to someone like me for free. Because I, I don't charge people to show them who they are. I would consider that to be a very bad idea. I don't mean a few bucks to rent the hall. I don't mean selling your books. You're giving them something. But to have them come to you for a weekend and pay some exorbitant fee and you're getting a cut of the hotel business and you're doing the restaurants too. And, you, and it's just a presentation, it's just business. I'm not saying it's bad, but it's not spiritual. It's just business. It could be the, the rock concert business, which I was a bit involved in years ago. It could be that and it would be the same thing. Same promotions, same sell the tickets, same, the performers get big money because there's all the geeks in the audience paying what they pay. And my advice to people who ask me is just don't do that. If you have an interest in spirituality, wonderful. 
read some of the beautiful texts that have existed through the centuries by people who don't need your money or listen to someone presently who's not trying to um, make a profession out of it, but it's just a wise. I'll mention my friend John Troy, T-R-O-Y. You can find him on Facebook. And he is a brilliant 80-year-old awakened spirit. <laughs> He's a beautiful cat. He talks to people for free. If someone goes to his Facebook page and engages him in a conversation, he, these pearls of wisdom will seem to just roll out of his mouth. See? And he's not charging for it. Well, so I wanted to plug John Troy because he doesn't get interviewed. I, I mentioned him to Rick Archer. He would have been perfect, but Rick hasn't picked up on it. And I don't know if he'll be alive next year, but if you guys do this again, we'll, we'll have to have him. Well, uh, Emerson seems pretty good at, at convincing people to, to, to come here because I think, didn't you first tell me you weren't interested? Um, I just, yeah, I, did, I, don't know if, I don't know if I expressed it that openly. Maybe he just picked up on the idea that this is the kind of thing, but this isn't. After meeting Emerson and now meeting you, I understand that it isn't. But this is a kind of thing that I usually avoid being paid for um, appearing. And that's because I don't want anything I say to be influenced in the slightest by whether it's popular or not. I don't even, I don't even want to feel that. What, I'm an old man. Years ago, not that many, but some years ago, maybe 15, a little more now, I'm getting old. I, I came to that, that I just want to be honest. That's all I want to, as self-expression. I don't want people to love me. Fortunately, I do have a few people who do, my family and a couple of friends, which is all a, a person can ever ask for in my book. But I don't want people to love me. I don't want them to think I'm clever. I don't want them to come to me and kiss my feet. I don't want those things because if that starts to happen, I may not tell the truth. We had a 10 day gathering down here in December, you know, that someone else cooked up and there, it was free form, no money involved. No plans, people have to make their own travel plans, get, book their own accommodations. And I would just show up for 10 days at, at a meeting site that we, that um, a friend uh, offered. And I would just sit there and take questions like we're doing now for 10 days. It's all on, it's all on uh, recorded on, on my YouTube channel. Well, I was treated in a way that normally I'm not treated. I mean, people like me, but I couldn't even get up and get a cup of coffee. If I made a move toward the, the coffee machine, somebody would be running there to get the cup and fill it up and everything. I'm not the kind of person to become inflated or to grasp that, that, that behavior, but I see that it could, it could be seductive. It wouldn't be to me because I like my privacy. I don't really want people around all the time bringing shit to me. But if I did, and they were cute girls, and all of this stuff that we actually know is going on, I probably would do that conference again, and again, and again, and again. Let's do one, we'll go down, meet Noel, we'll do it in Costa Rica, and then we'll do one in uh, Mozambique. <laughs> and, yeah, and I travel the world. I've got all kinds of cute people, wait, young people waiting on me hand and foot, and it's a good gig. I'm just not there. And that's why I feel that I have a certain authority to speak this way, truthfully, because the, I, I have nothing to gain, absolutely nothing to gain. I'm 75 years old. I already, I'm beat up. I already got 
aches and pains. I broke my back last year. I hurt when I get up every morning. I still like living, but I'm not that attached to it, to tell you the truth. <laughs> it's painful. I mean this. And so I'm not saying listen to Robert. That's really not my point. But listen to people who are speaking from their own experience. Elders are good. Elders are good. You don't need a 29-year-old phenom to be your fucking guru. Take my word for it. Don't. At least find somebody with some heft who's lived. Mm -hmm. And if that person offers you some wisdom, maybe there really is some. This thing, um, what's this guy's name? Bentino. You know who Bentino is? Sure. I said I wouldn't mention names, but I did. <laughs> he wasn't let, invited. Let, thank you. Let's move on. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so, um, well, and Robert, I just want to comment on something before getting to a question, but, you know, the, um, <clears throat> with this, we've actually, it's been work to, to be as authentic as possible in this. Um, and I think that also, you know, your authenticity and how you're approaching things, things might have the opposite effect because more people might want to listen to you because you don't give a shit. You know, you like being helpful, but you're not trying to be this, you know, this, this guru. Or it, it's even uncomfortable for you. So I wanted to comment on that. Um, I do want to get into some of these questions, though, with that, that base point. But I want to make sure the first topic that we talked about that you wanted to, are, are we done with that? Or should we come back? To oh, no, that's right. actually, okay. We covered that ground. In regard to what you just said, the great Jiddu Krishnamurti, who was a famous man all his life and had hundreds of people coming to his gatherings looking for this man's secret. When will he really reveal? When will he let his hair down? But he never did. He always talked in the third person. Is it all right, sir? You know, this kind of thing. Very formal wasn't really spilling the beans. But one day he said, do you want to know my secret? And it was like that. Do you remember this TV commercial where some brokerage guy yeah. remembers when he shuts up immediately? You remember that shit? <laughs> well, it was like that. Everybody just, and he said, my secret is, you know, I don't care. So that's what you were talking about, yeah? Perfect, yeah. It's, it, that's, that's freedom right there. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll go to these questions. Yeah. Um, what is the, what's the ultimate nature of reality? And is there any purpose of this existence? So is this a question that came from some viewer of our meeting? Yeah, or there's, there, people have been uh, pushing that Q&A button and Oh, oh, I see. There's 32 participants here. That's very nice. Yeah. Hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> see you. Well, and, and Robert, there's, we're recording this. Obviously, I, I told you I'd send you the link, but um, there are a lot more people that bought tickets that want to see the recording. So, well, you, this, is a two ring, that, this is the two ring circus, as I understand it. Is that right? There's it is. It's, a, it's, it's been exhausting, but uh, there's worth something it. else going on simultaneously. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Great. It's Emerson's fault. I blame him because he kept talking to amazing people and he's like, we need more slots. We need more slots. So yeah, two ring circus. Yeah. Um, would you repeat that? It's, it's going sure. between one here and out the other. Yeah. Um, what is the ultimate nature of reality? Is there any purpose of this existence? Yeah. Well, those are the questions that I say no human being is situated to reply to in a factual way because we would have to be standing outside of this to evaluate it. I don't know what the, I don't even know what reality is, much less its ultimate nature. And I think if you require meaning, you may not. There are people who are just natural existentialists. I'm not entirely that way, but I am to a degree. So I understand these other people who are, you know, just natural existentialists. They just live for the moment. You know, get on the motorcycle, stop at the 
cantina, have a drink, make love to some woman, and then down the road on the bike. <laughs> they find meaning in that. Or they're willing to live without the meaning that most of us think we need. So I don't know which, whatever. I'm a little like that, but not, not whole hog. But if you need meaning, my advice, I'm giving advice. I finally jumped the, the track. Um, for a long time, I had a policy of never speaking that way in order not to be confused with these people who speak from on high. But I'm, but I'm not speaking from on high. I'm really not, and I hope that's understood. I'm just telling you my experience for what it's worth. I don't claim to be the purveyor of all knowledge and reality, far from it. There's so much I don't know. And the more I find out, the more I see how much more there is that I don't know. So my ignorance is expanding. My circle of ignorance is expanding. It's beyond my control. There's so, if I spend an hour in the garden, which I love to do, and start looking at little insects and their life there, there's so much going on in just this one little patch that I know nothing about. And it really can't totally be explained to me. But, oh, now I've gotten side Oh, yes, meaning. If you need meaning, my advice is find meaning in friendships, love affairs, the work that you do, the way that you can help other people if that arises. And I think you may find enough meaning in that so that you won't have, need, need some guarantee or some esoteric explanation of reality. You can have that also. But try to find meaning in what's right in front of you on the table where it always is. There's always something to do if you, for yourself, self-compassion, or for someone else, compassion for, for others. I, I'm never bored. That's why. There's always something. I could, if I'm bored, I could go wash the dishes that are in the sink. See, that's, to me, that is meaning. There's no ultimate meaning in washing the dishes, but the meaning is now my wife doesn't have to. <laughs> that's the meaning. Uh, that's, that's all you get. <laughs> that's the meaning. <laughs> that, will not, that will not get you into heaven. You, it won't improve your, your virtue credentials for Buddhism or anything. It's just a, a thing, just a little thing. Yeah, okay. So that's that, that's that question. Checked it off. Yeah, there, there were a couple of people. So I, I can get them from you later and we'll post them. But people are asking the name of the author that you mentioned. I know Tim Freak was one of them that wrote 38 books. But what was the, um, the oh, Christian John, mystic? Merton? Oh, oh um, uh, Thomas Merton. M-E-R-T-O-N. Thomas, Thomas Merton. Merton. Okay. I have to pick up on him because that's a religious view. Okay. Which I don't have, but he that's he's got a valid one in my in my opinion okay great um so uh do you have an experience on surrender that you care to share with us oh really well yeah <laughs> i mean yeah it's not a yes or no question last year i'm pouring some cafe here i don't know if you can see that now you can Last year, I was up in Seattle, Washington. I'm sure glad I'm not there now. Um, visiting my son who lives there. And um, I was 74 at the time. Um, but really fit. The two of us went for a long hike, maybe 10 miles, and came back. And I was feeling great. And um, then, then he wanted to do a little boating. And we we got out in a boat and there was an accident and I broke my back. Um, it was excruciatingly painful. I will never be able to express in words how deeply painful having broken vertebrae is. The spinal column is running right down the center of that fracture. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I needed surgery and I was in bed for four months. I had to wait for the surgery. Evaluation had to be done. And then I'm, I'm um, down here in Mexico at the time, 
because I'd come home with this just strapped together, not knowing that it was a, a real fracture at the time. I thought it was just a bad, you know, I, I, I've been an you know, outdoors person, so I didn't take it that seriously. But when I got back, I, I needed the surgery and then I, it was terribly painful before the surgery. It was painful after the surgery. And I was in bed flat on my back for three and a half months. And then I had a year of rehab that was terribly painful. Well, it's more than surrender. And this is something that I'm trying to get across about my experience. And I think that will resonate with other people. Even with all of that pain and suffering, there were moments of great beauty, great beauty and love and gratitude for being alive at all, for having people to care for me when I was beat up like this, for having my mind intact so that I could entertain myself and love other people still, although not with any physical gestures. See, this is all we get. Something bad will happen to you sooner or later. You may be on a long lucky streak now, but it, will, it cannot last. You're playing against the house and the house always wins. Always wins. This is the essence of Buddhism for people who are interested in getting away from this Hindu cult. It is a cult. I'm not saying there's nothing in it. There have been some people of wisdom involved in that, but mostly it's a cult of, of gurus who know reality. The Jananis, they, that means I know ultimate reality. That, I, we haven't checked that question off. Ultimate reality, there's people who know it. They're walking around in the air taking a shit just like you do. And, Guy wakes up with a heart on in the morning and everything, but he knows, he knows reality, that's it. So listen to him, and you, then you'll know reality. Oh, come on, come on, give me a break, wake up. So the essence of Buddhism is to embrace suffering because it's part of life. You embrace life. You become life-oriented. You're not looking for the escape hatch. You're going to work with what's on the table right now. That's where the love is. To talk about love in the abstract. No, there may be such a thing, capital L love. I'm not saying there isn't. I don't think there is. I think it's more like the, the uh, vitalism. You know, there's this supposed principle love. That's not what animates us. I don't think it really is. I think it's more instinct. We're mammals, and we, other mammals nest and raise their young. And that's love. In, as I experience it, if this other thing exists, Robert is not speaking from that place. I'm not. I'm speaking from a place of an ordinary human guy with grandchildren and a wife and kids. and earned a living doing some work and all this. And those other guys, I don't believe them. When they talk that way, I just never believed them. Nisargadatta fre frequented brothels and was a chain smoker and died of throat cancer. That's fine. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of those things per se. But is that really the one who knew ultimate reality? It's hard to, hard to believe. No, I don't believe it. So, well, I've, I've kicked the shit out of that team. That's not <laughs> <laughs> Indeed you have. So then, um, <laughs> where, uh, in terms of like, in terms of, you have to forgive me for, for, for ranting, but you, it, it's, it's, like, it's like this. I'm silent a lot of the time, and I don't think about these things. I have done. There was a time when I really thought about these things deeply and came to an understanding. 
that understanding is what I call a wave. You actually get it. Hey, this is real. I'm here. This is what I got. Whatever's here right now in this moment, this is it, baby. There may be a future, but maybe there isn't. There may be uh, whatever they all promise you, but maybe there isn't. Mm -hmm. Maybe there isn't no Jesus in heaven or, or whatever, angels. Maybe there is no, oh, um, yes, a reflection. When I told you before that speaking about vitalism might hurt someone, and then you concluded, I don't think anybody really got hurt. You didn't, yeah. But you don't sell naturopathic um, preparations for healing. Those people don't coexist with a guy like me. They can't, they cannot. Their theory is you put something in water, you shake it up, and some principle that was in that thing, it's unknown principle that can't be measured by any scientific instruments, but they just know it exists. It passes into the water, and then they take one drop of that water and put it in 10 gallons of water and shake it up and take a drop of that. And the more, the kicker here, and this is kind of like the Jehovah's Witnesses, the gold tablets, and all that jazz. It's the same thing. It's made up shit. What they say is the more they dilute it, the stronger it gets. Even to when there is not a molecule of the original substance left in the water, that's the really good shit. Now pay me. It, it's a scam. I'm not saying that people don't believe in it. I'm, the purveyors of what I mean. A lot of them do. I would wager that almost all of them believe and they're not they're not hustlers but they are quacks <laughs> and we know that about cures from the past that turned out to be quackery like snake oil or whatever but this is going on now and the anti-science people and the anti-intellectuals also that's a big slice of of spirituality community is anti-intellectual. Don't think, oh, no, no. No, because if you think, then, gee, you may lose track of the plot here. You may start thinking subversive ideas. <laughs> okay. Perfect. I'm so, um, back to you. No, these are, I, I would, no, people aren't here to see me talk. Um, so it, this is a great question, actually. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in your response. Let's put it that way. Why is it that the people we love most drive us so crazy at times? Oh, that's a good question for a depth psychologist. Really perfect question. The, the people we marry and, or hook up with and seriously, you don't have to be married. But a, an attraction, a deep attraction, that you don't want to leave that person, but the person pisses you off. So you're like in a revolving door. God, you fucking piss me off, but I still like fucking you. See, this, this is where a lot of people are living their lives. They're stuck right there. And that's what this question is about. Somebody asked that question, I assume, wants to get unstuck figure this thing out. Well, without a personal conversation, I'm, I can't really penetrate that. But I would say to try to look at that other person, take a vacation from being pissed off if you can, or at least to the extent that you can, and look at that person and try to divine or observe the qualities in that person that are like your mother or your father. Because one of the main ways that we humans fall in love, as it's called, feel attracted, is that it provides us with a chance to go, do it over again, do, do a relationship over again, and this time get it right. And the original relationships were with mommy and daddy, not this cute girl that you met. So, if you're in a relationship like that, you may be able to heal it by finding out more about your feelings for your parents 
And you could get help doing this. That's what psychoth death psychotherapy will be about. That. It won't be giving you a list of affirmations or something. That's not death psychotherapy. That's quack psychotherapy. Death psychotherapy is when you go into your own emotional experience and you ask yourself questions about it. What is there about my wife that just pisses me off? What is it? Let's get to the bottom of it. It can't be that she left the cap off the toothpaste too. That's what I yelled at her about. But no, go sit by yourself and say, okay, I blew my top. You forgive yourself and then you say, but what really bugs me about this person? What's the underlying? And if you're trapped by that, I think you've got to go one way or another. If it's that bad, get out of it. And if it's not that bad and you really don't want to get out of it, be honest with yourself. You don't want to get out of it, if that's how you feel. Then you have to do this work. Because to be in this revolving door, it's the, you're better off alone. Much better. Even if there are kids involved. If you have to get a divorce, get one. Because kids don't like to grow up seeing this conflict. It hurts them every day. And their happiness comes from the happiness of the mommy and daddy. So if you are stuck in the revolving door, you're teaching your kid a crummy lesson. Okay, that's the psychological lecture in, in two minutes. <laughs> no, that's perfect. Well, and you know, I, I have yet to... Uh... I'm 47. I have yet to speak with anyone that regrets getting divorced when it was necessary. So, can when when it's time, uh, it's time. Especially, well, you you come from a different generation, which is cool. You guys have loosened up the lacings on that one quite a bit. In my day and age, it was still in my day and age. Boy, Robert, you know, the Walker, <laughs> young whippersnappers. <laughs> When I was growing up, it was a shameful thing to come from a broken family. And the parents didn't want, didn't want to visit that shame on their children. So, mm -hmm. and also the women, because the women didn't really work in those days, unless economic circumstances forced them to, um, they didn't really have a way of surviving if they didn't keep on serving their husband's needs servicing him, let's say, his needs. Um, so it's different now. It's, yeah. it's, and that's good. I, you know, I, I know, I know that we, we have further to go with real equality of the sexes. But we have come a long way in my 75 years, a very, very long way. Betty Crocker isn't in the kitchen anymore. Wearing her fuck me shoes and her little apron. It's different now. Definitely different now. Um, Robert, can you talk, this isn't necessarily a question, but I would just want to have you talk a little bit about the present moment, because it comes up a lot, um, you know, now, 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 now. Oh, what a good question. Well, there's a misunderstanding about that, that really seems to confuse a lot of people. It's true that now is all there is that we know of. I mean, that's verifiable. If it isn't, I'm not gonna lay that out, that argument out here. You can investigate it. Many people can t tell you about that. Um, Eckhart Tolle is good on it. Can read one of his books. But the confusion is that just being in the now fixes everything. That's not true. The now may be all messed up. Often it is. There's something else that's involved beyond just, I'm here now. Great, meanwhile, you're freaking out. <laughs> that's not it. That, that's the now, I agree with that, and you're in it. No doubt of that. But there's something else that has to take place. There's an understanding that has to take place and be in the now. And then you bring the understanding to the chaos. And, oh, now. 
and then you just sit there. Or go river rafting. It's, it's okay, <laughs> you have every right. See, that's, it's not about adjusting the now to make it be good. To, no, it's about actually committing oneself to take a bite out of now and chew it up and swallow it. And sometimes it's hard to get down. It's true. Sometimes you have barely enough saliva to get it down. But that's the job, not escape to some dreamland where just being, once I learned to be in the now, everything will be just wonderful. I don't think so. I didn't think it was great when I was lying there in a boat with my back broken. I didn't think so, that the now was wonderful, not at all. I thought, this is fucked up. <laughs> so here's, here's what needs to be understood, in my view. I'm not teaching this. Please don't make a teacher out of me. I understand, I get it. Meta everything, I, I know. I'm, I'm the uncola. John Troy, my friend John Troy said, Robert, you're the uncola. That's your brand. The uncola, nice. <laughs> you're the uncola, Robert. <laughs> well, there's a specific reason we, we use the term speakers and authors in describing this. So uh, if anyone uh, thinks that you're teaching them, then that's, you know, that's, that's on them. But. Okay. But what I think needs to be, in my view, what needs to be brought to the now is a certain understanding. And that is that this sense of self that you are suffering, because after all, if you had no sense of self, there would be no suffering. Back would be broken, but it wouldn't be happening to anybody. And that's the non-duality seekers that want to be nobody. That's their idea. I'm nobody. No, I don't really exist. And they get this all this elaborate rigmarole about it. It's unconvincing at best. Poor logic. Well, anyway, that, I've said that a million times. What I'm saying here is pretty fresh because it's, I'm replying to your question. Um, the sense of self arises in us from preconceptual awareness. This is not new. This is not a new idea. I, I take it back to the Buddha and the five skandhas, which someone could look up, five skandhas. But I've modernized it because I'm aware of 2,500 years of science and psychology and philosophy that the Buddha did not have access to. And so I've improved on it. Oh. oh, you said that? This is better than the Buddha? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that I had 25 years, 2,500 years of science, philosophy, and all the rest in order to understand what this cat was saying. And I can translate it into contemporary jargon. And I think this may be helpful. That's all I'm saying, not, not Robert Saltzman is better than anybody. Not, I am you. That's part of what it means to be awake. We're all in the same boat. When I talk about anxiety, I'm not saying your anxiety. How would I know about anxiety if I didn't feel it? Okay, so that's, that's important to understand. We're all in the same boat. Preconceptual awareness. For example, right now, through the process that's called interoception, the organs and structures of your body are sending messages to your brain constantly, constantly. There's also proprioception, which is information about where your arms and legs and body parts are. You don't have to look down at your feet when you walk. So that's proprioception. You're also not conscious of it. It's pre-conceptual awareness. The awareness is there, but you have no concept of, I must move my foot three degrees to the right and three degrees to the left, etc. You can even make driving a car preconceptual. It can happen if you're a good driver and you practice. The preconceptual awareness 
is prior to conscious experience, but it is what is making the, con the conscious experience. It's what it's arises and bubbles up to conscious awareness, and we call that myself. In other words, feelings, preconceptual feelings, arise from the stomach constantly. The stomach is filled with nerve cells that report to the brain, not just when you're hungry, but all day long and night. Digestion is going on, chemical processes are taking place, the brain is in charge of some of that, they're all constantly, constantly. Blah, 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 blah. And this is taking place at lightning speed. Okay. Now you awake, uh, aware, aware you, conceptual you, Robert, says, I feel hungry. That's the concept made up of these, this preconceptual report that now to ego myself feels urgent because it's painful. And that's what pain is for to say, hey, <laughs> you don't usually notice this shit, man, but look down at your ankle, it's broken. And now you can't keep walking. See, if we didn't have the, 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 the pain, we wouldn't be aware. And we'd, one night of sleep and you have your arms all wrapped around and broken and your legs and all the rest, inappropriate positions, you know. And so my, that's what myself is. Not just hunger, but that's part of myself. Not just, why am I getting an erection? Because I see this certain stimulus, whereas the person of the opposite sex seeing the same ass doesn't really turn me on, see? That is preconceptual. And then I say, oh, I'm heterosexual. No, you aren't. That's just the, pre those are the, that's the programming. It's not you. You are that which has a name and has to live life in the moment when all the preconceptual uh, awarenesses bubble up and come into view and you have to deal with it. Oh, I, here I am in church and I'm standing in the choir in tight pants and I'm getting the erection. Whoa, now, you see, now this, I wonder if I really want to be in this particular now. I think I'll wait for now I like better and be in that one. I think I'll wait until I'm celibate and have tamed my sexual impulses. And then I'll be in that now. And I can, I can do that. A Zen master will teach me to stare at the wall for 10 hours a day. I have a friend who did this for his entire 20s. He teach me to stare at the wall for 10 hours a day. And eventually I will vanquish my asanas. My, mm -hmm. uh, asana is not the right word. My vas, vasanas. I'll vanquish them. See, this is absurd. This is just absurd on the face of it. If somebody likes that, okay. People like heaven and Jesus. That's absurd also, I say. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about being in the now. That's, what, that's as far as Eckhart got you, and that's great. Mm -hmm. He's right. You have to be in the now. But the way to be in the now, I'm saying, is to understand that you aren't doing this. This is being done. You are the small slice of this brain that's conscious of what all the rest of the brain is conscious of all the time, preconceptually, and you're not in on it. Mm -hmm. And so your decisions come from activities going on that you cannot fathom. You have no way. And I want to say one more thing about this. If, is there time? We've got, we're, we're over, but we got about one more minute. Can you do it in a minute? Yeah, I can do it All in right, a minute. All right, perfect, perfect. For, for those who say, oh, well, the brain doesn't really exist. It's all, it's all consciousness. People say that. But they're not up on science. There's experiments going on now where people can be shown pictures and a computer program can draw from just brain scans that were done, just knowing which neurons were being activated, draw a picture. And when that's put together, sometimes they're an exact match. Often they're just almost off by just a little. Now, you can't deny that. No one's dreaming that. This is just a machine doing this. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you really believe that 
consciousness is everything and, and reality, material reality doesn't exist. You have to be able to explain that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can. That is a perfect place to end. Robert, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time today. No, you're really a lovely person. And I did most of the talking, but it's, it's your openness actually. And your, um, God, I can't really find the word. You're a very beautiful cat and I could feel it. And I, when, it, when I looked at your face, I could tell that you were understanding me mm -hmm. and approving of what I was saying. And it made it so easy to just think it. Of course, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I appreciate it so much. Um, I know everyone else does as well. I told you I'll get you the recording, so we'll do that. Um, but ha have a lovely rest of your day.